Two days of pine trees and chill mountain mists finally opened onto the walled town of Four Trails. The three mounted men sent ahead of the caravan to scout the road emerged from the tree line, riding slowly across the clear-cut field till the gate guards came into view. The twins, identical save for the color of their cloaks, jostled each other, excited for a night of drink and a day or two out of the saddle. You still owe us each a beer, Eric. Remember Corby? Yeah, Tabs, I do. As short as the twins were, the third boy was even shorter, but nearly as wide at the shoulder as the other two combined. He pushed his red hair out of his eyes with a hand most would say was too scarred for one his age as he eyed the two. I told you I wasn't paying on that wager, you cheats. Grinning, one of the twins danced his horse sideways into Eric's old bay, making it toss and snort in the irritation. Knock it off, orc sucker. Tape it. Head back and tell here and there an hour away. Koreb, let's see what this little shoal has for sale. Tabin groaned pathetically as he turned his horse around. Now you really do owe me a round. You mule herds better not start the fun till I get back. With a kick, Tab started back towards the tree line, grumbling loudly over the hoofbeats. What a sack, Corb drawled as he started towards the gate. Eric grinned at his back as he began to follow. Yeah, an ugly to boot. The two spent most of the next hour wandering the streets, gathering information about the local trade and asking directions to several shops Huron had done business with on previous visits. The folk of Fort Trail were well used to the caravans that traveled the mountain passes between Kendall and Fandolin. It had been some time since an ob from the clans had been through. Perhaps not since Ob Yosel's last visit many years before. The merchants they made brief contact with were all excited to see them, several asking after Huron by name. As the end of the hour approached, Eric nearly had to drag Cora Boy from the young lady they had found selling brass housewares outside her family's smithy. Come on, we need to get back to the gate. They don't need us yet. They'll be hours setting up for the night. Master Huron wanted us to report to him as soon as he arrived. We're not keeping him or Master Neffin waiting. Mention of the bosun brought a swift end to Corb's mooning, and after a few winks and promises to return, they hurried off. By the time they reached the gate, Obiosal was filing out of the tree line, each of the huge wagons lumbering into the clearing on four stout legs. The style of the wagons varied greatly from huge two-story homes that would not have looked out of place on any of the streets of Four Trail to some of the oldest wagons, little more than rough-hewn log cabins that had served the Ob for generations. The two guards stationed at the east gate of Four Trails stared slack-jawed at the caravan as it began forming a great circle in the clearing, not even acknowledging Eric or Koreb as they passed out onto the road. As the boys neared the closest wagon, a blocky stone construct with narrow arched windows and crenellations, the driver seated in the enclosed balcony at the front waved before bringing the tiny castle to a stop. With a whispered word, the wagon lowered itself to the ground settling its legs beneath it like an enormous cat. Eric waved up to the man as the wagon came to rest. Hello, Daywin. Just come from the town. Seen Master Huron about? The middle-aged man opened the gate set in the railing, kicked out a rope ladder, and clambered down. I haven't seen him since this morning. Neffin's on the road, though, directing wagons. Daywin pointed the way as his family began pouring out the back of the wagon. Come by later, Eric. Kel took a bore a few hours ago, and I owe your dad for some work done. Ask him if he'd want a few cuts for part pay. And you're both welcome, of course, to sit down for a plate. Thanks, Daywin. I'll let him know. Old Neffin, the clan bosun, was out on the road giving directions to the families just arriving from the forest road. The old man cranked and wheezed at every wagon that rumbled by, cussing for all he was worth at every man he saw before doffing his floppy hat, all smiles and lovely to see you at any woman that passed. The only men seemingly exempt from his ire were those that rode guard on the train. Helmeted outriders in chain vests and painted leather skirts, divided for riding, passed Nevin with curt nods or stopped to deliver quick reports. Eric, who suddenly realized Corb had disappeared, found himself alone and hesitated a moment before deciding to just get it over with. Master Nevin, irritated that someone would interrupt what was shaping up to be a particularly well-crafted telling off, Nevin rounded on the intruder. What? What's your need, boy? You best not be wondering where your hands are needed. If you need to be asking that, then you're too stupid to be any help to anyone. With unusual swiftness, the old man whipped his hat off to smile at a plump woman passing by with a basket of herbs and berries scavenged from the roadside propped on one hip. 
Good day, Miss Olufsen. That raspberries you're hauling there? Wouldn't be planning on making some of your tarts, would em? Smiling ruefully as she passed, the woman called over her shoulder. You're as bad as my boys, Neff. Come by later. I'll save one for you. With Mrs. Olufsen passed, Neffin smashed his hat back on his head and rounded back on Eric. Dead seas, boy. You got turds for brains? What? Eric, wide-eyed and red-faced under Neffin's impatient glare, spilled the last hour's work in town out and tumbled before turning to leave. Neffin froze him in his tracks. You stay in camp, you hear? You stick to your da, right? Herons might want a word with you later. And slow it down when you do. You ain't drinking fish piss, boy. Take your time with it. Eric nodded and hurried away as Neffin turned back to the wagons, promising himself that Korb was going to pay for that stunt. A crowd had begun to gather outside the gates as word of the Obe's arrival spread, and the road soon turned into a small carnival as folk of the clan came out to greet them and keep them out of the way while the caravan finished setting up. Sweets were passed around, sample wares shown off, and directions given to various wagons. With so many outside the walls, the town watch decided to set up a detail in the fields around the crowd, and they too were treated. Tiny cigars that smelled of wood smoke and mint were passed around with apples and samples of mead by the clan's outriders, and as evening fell, the trade bell was rung and the citizens were led into the circled wagons. Since the Obe's last visit, the cities of Kendall and Fandolin had settled their disputes and worked together to make the trade road between the two safe. A series of signal towers carried news and information across the mountains that divided them, and more recently, a cabal of rangers and druids had formed it and taken to patrolling and protecting the paths through the range. With the area under the protection of the two city-states, dwarves from the mines further north and elves out of the wooded valleys to the south had begun trading with the towns nearest the trade route. With the increase in trade, the Four Trails had become a very prosperous town, and its citizens were eager to deal with the old for all manner of foreign and exotic goods. Hours later, the night bell rang, signaling the end of the day's dealings. The trading families hurried their final sales as outriders moved among the townsfolk, informing them they would reopen at noon the next day for a full day's trade, encouraging word of mouth with promises of an even greater array of items. Eric had found Korob and Taven earlier and agreed to meet them on the road into town after the wagons were secured for the night. When he arrived, the twins weren't alone. They had dragged out Mekin, the dour young acolyte of Hor, who already looked tired of the twins' antics and ready to go home. Sighting Eric, Mekin rolled his eyes and fell in beside him. How do you put up with these two? Eric smiled, kicking road dust onto one of the twins' boots as he shouldered aside the other to start up the road. You've got little brothers. Push them around till they do what they're told. Taven straightened from brushing the dirt off his boot. I'd like to see you try, you ox! Taven danced out in front of Eric, hopping along backwards with his fists up. His brother rolled his eyes before taking a step and landing a solid punch on his brother's shoulder. Taven winced and wheeled towards his brother in protest just as Eric stepped forward and pushed him off balance. Landing on his butt in the dust, Taven glared up as the three boys passed by laughing. Eric smiled at Mekin, chuckling. See? Quiet as he's been all day. The insults and antics ramped up until even Mekin joined in, but as they neared the east gate to Four Trails, they all quieted. Standing with the two guards was a tall, thick-shouldered man, his white hair streaked with the last few blonde locks of his youth. Seeger was the clan's high priest, a named man, and a council member besides. All four of them had grown up with stories of the named men of the clans, and the exploits of Stone Seeger were well known to them all. The story of his naming varied depending on the teller, but it basically went that Seeger had earned it when the Obe had been attacked by a hill giant while crossing into Cormier. As the giant hurled boulders at the wagon train, a number of men rode out to confront it, Seeger among them. Several died that day trying to bring the brute down with bowfire, but Seeger rode straight in, and after the giant kicked his horse out from under him, Seeger scooped up a rock, brought it down on the giant's toe. Screaming in agony, the giant fell and Seeger leapt onto its back to bury his wood axe in the back of its head. The old warrior straightened from his stout cane at their approach, eyeing each of them in turn before nodding to them solemnly. Good evening. Eric stepped ahead of the others and bowed slightly. Good evening, Master Seeger. I'm afraid I have to turn you back, boys. Storms rise, and Master Huron calls the Obe to port. The young men glanced sideways at each other, surprised. None of them had ever been summoned to attend port. 
Eric bowed in acknowledgement of the ancient summons, struggling momentarily to remember the formal reply he had heard his father give in years past. We ride the storm and heed the call, Master Seeger. Eric, Mekin, and the twins went straight back to camp after the summons. Korup and Tapin were scooped up by their father when they returned to the wagon for stools. He seemed surprised and pleased the boys had been called to port, but insisted they attend with he and their mother. Promising to find them after, Eric and Mekin continued on to their own wagons for seats before heading to the gathering place. A silver moon hung over the large, open area at the center of the wagon circle. A siren's moon, Rennie's grandmother used to call it. As the tall, fair-haired woman led her grandfather through the crowd to the campfire at the center. Mord, known as the Half Hill, was the tallest man of the Obe. Even stooped as he was with age, he was a full head over all but his granddaughter. Rennie pointed old Mord towards the elders seated at the far side of the fire. Thank you, my dear. Do you see Kelv anywhere? Yes, he's here. Good. I owe that old Flint a knock or two. He hasn't been round to sample the new mead. Rennie patted her grandfather on the arm and smiled up at him. She didn't have the heart just then to remind him Kelv had been by two nights past to do just that. Of course, she thought, considering how much sampling they had done, Kelv might not remember the night either. Rennie guided him to the seat next to Kelv and the other elders before wandering back into the crowd. With a good spot claimed near the front, Eric and Mekin wandered, trading hands and hugs with the older folk of the Ope as they tried to find out what the summons was all about. As they made their way around the entire circle and back to their seats, Eric spotted Rennie and waved her over. Ren! Ren, over here! The tall woman unfolded her stool and sat next to Zoom, but before they could ask her if she knew why the gathering had been called, a whistle shrilled and dipped, calling the crowd's attention. Nefin let the long note die and bowed slightly to Huron before resuming his seat. Huron stood and began pacing around the fire, nodding and waving to people as the last few stragglers quietly found places to sit. He was a stout man, in his forties, younger than the rest of the council, but an accomplished and well-respected man nonetheless. He had led the Obe for many years. Good evening, everyone. It's been some time since the Obe was called to port, but we have been asked for counsel and possibly aid in a local matter. As you know, the good people of Four Trails maintain the primary trade route between Fandolin and Kendall, an arrangement we have benefited from many times over the years. In gratitude to Four Trails, and with your blessing, we would like to provide that help by calling up a crew quiet murmur rose from the crowd at mention of crewing. It was an old tradition, from before the burning of the fleet, a ritual undertaken by the clan's warriors that would bind them to each other and to a task set them by the clan's leaders. More than that, though, it was the start of a journey, one that would take the oath-bound out into the world to seek the road home, a way back to the lands of their fathers, a way back to sea home. Eric sat stunned at the announcement. Obioso was not a large clan, claiming fewer than a hundred wagons, and had not sworn a crew in his lifetime. Hardly realizing what he was doing, Eric stood. As surprised as he was to find himself standing, he realized Rennie and Mekin were on their feet too. Before any of them could speak, a quiet row drew everyone's attention. The twins, half standing, were bent over and wobbling as their mother tugged on their sleeves and hissed furiously in their ears. After a tense few moments, their father went to kneel by her side. Whatever he said seemed to collapse her resolve. She stood with them, sobbing openly as she straightened their shirts and gave each a kiss on the cheek. She sat down quickly and buried her face in their father's chest as the boys turned back to the fire, red-faced and breathless. A moment later, another boy, far back in the crowd, stood. Eric didn't know Tharsis well. Few in the clan did. He was from another Obe sent with his younger sister a couple of years ago to study under Master Olnid, the clan's windwright. Huron continued pacing around the fire, waiting to see if anyone else would stand. When it seemed none would, he continued, We have our crew. Come forward. Eric made his way forward with the others, his heart beating loud enough he thought the entire oak might hear. Huron greeted each in turn with a shake of the hand and a reassuring nod before lining them up and beckoning the twins forward. Turning back to the crowd, he called out, We have here true sons of the clan, Korib and Tabid Carlson. Who will stand for them? The twins' mother and father stood, their mother smiling, though visible tears streaked her cheeks. 
Their older brother and his wife stood as well, along with several close friends of the family. Kieran nodded gravely and brought Mekin forward. We have here a true son of the clan, Mekin Yarbol. Who will stand for him? Mekin was one of the younger of a large family, and his parents stood with his many siblings, aunts, uncles, and even his aging grandmother scattered throughout the crowd. Tharsis was next. We have here a true son of the clan, entrusted to our care and teaching by Clan Yarborg. Tharsis Ornison. Who will stand for him? As Master Olnid stood, a high-pitched voice called from the back of the crowd. Me! Me! I will! Everyone turned to find a small girl standing on top of the nearest wagon, waving her hand in the air. Having suddenly drawn the attention of nearly the entire clan, the skinny girl's enthusiasm faltered. Those closest to the fire could see Huron's small grin as he addressed the girl gravely. Young lady, I don't believe you were summoned to this port. The girl visibly shrank at the rebuke, raised hand falling to her side. Huron continued, addressing the ob. As the only family present today, would any object to Tines Ornison attending the clan's port? At the responding silence, the girl re-enervated and quickly clambered down the side of Master Olnid's stout wagon. Nearly tripping over several in the crowd, she quickly made her way to her brother and hugged him before Master Olnid beckoned her to his side. Smiling, Master Huron continued, I will stand for the boy myself. Do any others? Master Olnid's aged wife, Medine, slowly rose with the help of a nearby young man and waved. Huron called on Rennie next, who quickly glanced at Eric with a tight, nervous smile. I have here a true daughter of the clan, Rennie our Dorman. Who will stand for her? Rennie's grandfather, Kelv, and several others of the council stood, as did many scattered throughout the gathering. Eric could hardly breathe as Huron beckoned him forward. We have here a true son of the clan, Eric Yarin. Who will stand for him? Eric's father stood first, an unreadable expression on his face, before his aunt and uncle and those cousins of his present stood too. Eric stepped back into line as Huron continued on, calling an end to the port, thanking everyone for attending and asking those that had stood in support of the clan's youth to stay. After most of the Ob had returned to their wagons, the council and those asked to stay planned out the provisioning of the volunteers interrupted regularly by the clan's named men and women dropping by to offer food, drink, and their support. Hours later, with only the council and a few clansmen who had themselves sworn to accrue in years long past, the youths knelt before Master Seeger, High Priest of Hor, to take their oaths.